Welcome to this week's webinar, Hamilton Wealth Partners in our series on thought leaders. Um, and we're very lucky to be joined by our special guest today, Peter Cooper. Peter's the Chief Investment Officer and Chairman of Cooper Investors. As with other uh, webinars, I'm going to first of all read out a general advice warning. So the information contained in this webinar has been provided as general advice only. The contents have been prepared without taking into account your objectives, financial situation or needs. You should, before you make any decision regarding any information, strategies or products mentioned in this webinar, consult your advisor to consider whether that is appropriate having regard to your objectives, financial situations and needs. Also, um, as with other web webinars, this is under Chatham House rules as well. So look, Peter's a leader in the funds management industry in Australia. He founded and built the highly regarded firm of Cooper Investors. Peter's lived through three major and three minor downturns in markets. And it's not just the opportunities that come from these downturns, but how and when to react and position a portfolio to capitalise on these downturns. Downturns have many similarities, but they also have many differences. And in the case of pandemic that we're going through, I believe very difficult to compare what we're experiencing at, experiencing at the moment with either the GFC or something like uh, the Asia crisis. But enough for me, as, as per usual, we're going to be allowed time for questions and on the toolbar at the bottom, you'll see the Q&A box. So please use that. Thank you and welcome, Peter. Well, thank you, uh, Will, and um, hello to everyone. Recognise uh, a number of names on the call and really look forward to a, a bit of a dialogue. I'm going to talk for uh, 15 odd, odd minutes and then um, we'll open up for, for Q&A and you can uh, point me in, in the directions of, of your interest. Um, <clears throat> Will, Will asked me to talk a little bit about my background, which I can go on for hours about, Will, but I'll, I'll try and keep it short. But um, I, do, I do want to talk about it because it's been very, very important um, in terms of shaping, I guess, the uh, investment philosophy that uh, has been adopted by Cooper and investors. Um, <clears throat> and ba basically in short, uh, my family history and background really, really important. My uh, family came from New Zealand. They were uh, a, a pretty well, well healed crew back in the, uh, the last century and um, had a publicly listed company called Cooper Seeds, um, which was founded in 1860 <clears throat> by um, 1970. After a hundred year celebration, um, the co company was no more um, as a result of uh, family uh, nepotism and poor financial management. Father moved to Brunswick, Melbourne, uh, became a jailer, um, basically uh, came to Australia without anything from the, uh, the, the, the vast uh, empire that was no more and uh, really was a, um, uh, was, a, was a prison guard actually at Pentridge during the um, murder of uh, a fellow called George Hodson. Um, Ron, Ryan, Ron Ryan was the uh, the chap that was the last person hung as a result of that um, um, incident. And anyway, my, my family moved to the outback of Northern Territory where um, my father was a small time businessman, hotels, motels, um, hospitality industry, and uh, ended up on the Gold Coast, um, sort of owning a used car yard there where I went to school. Now I'll give you that quick rip around the, uh, the world in terms of my history because it's littered with small business up and down, liquidity crises, um, bankruptcies or near, near bankruptcies. Um, and so that's, that's just a, a very big part of my, I guess, uh, investing style at a very personal level. Um, the idea of cycles and the need for latency in, uh, in thinking about investing, whether it's in the unlisted or, or the listed, listed marketplaces. Um, fast forward after a pretty late start at the age of 27, I uh, started at State Superboard, which was uh, Australia's largest pension fund back in the, uh, the late 80s. It was the New South Wales Government Employees Superannuation, superannuation Fund. And um, there were a number of rules back then in the mid, mid 80s, which were loosened up as part of a sort of general deregulation that really prohibited um, super funds from having, and I can't remember the exact number, well, but I think it was like, you know, 30, 30, 40% in equities maximum. And so State Super hit the, hit the 87 crash for those old enough to remember as effectively a, you know, 40, 50% downturn in a very short period of time. Um, I was six months into the job as a, <clears throat> as a junior analyst and um, it was an extraordinary time leading up to the October, October crash. And uh, really saw lots of 
kind of interesting interesting behavioural things around sort of valuations and um, you know the madness of crowds, if you like. <clears throat> um, as a result of the property sector um, being a big big part of the super fund back then, the property department went mad, empowered by the fact that their assets didn't go down, and the equity department were uh, suffering suffering that that terrible downturn. <clears throat> and between 1987 and, and um, about 1990, the property market just just went berserk, including state super. They really, uh, and, and this is such a long time ago, I'm, I'm happy to uh, report it was just out of control and basically put options or, or written put options against property developers. Governor Philip Tower, which many of you would know from Sydney, one of the premier buildings there, um, had a performance contract written um, with the Grollo, Grollo Construction Company and um, as a result of sort of unionisation and some of the delays in the market, the wisdom um, of the property team there decided to write this performance contract. And of course, the property came out uh, out of the ground about a floor a day, um, only only to finish and, and complete. Um, and the and the property market had crashed. Um, liquidity was a massive issue. State super went to roughly forty percent in in property as a result of the decline in equities. Um, and the fact that the um, uh, you know, decision to invest in all, all these properties plus property development plus put options, there was one in Perth, the QVC building, I think there was one in Melbourne as well, which is sort of put back to the pension fund. So I just mentioned that I think the superannuation industry is in much better, better shape, much better governance today. Um, having said that, there's a number of big super funds that uh, were relying upon, I guess, the diversity of of their constituency and the inflow, you know, constant inflow of funds, only to find that, um, and particularly anyone exposed to the hospitality and retail industry, that's, that backdrop has a very different feel today. So I would imagine there's some quite, you know, there's some quite uh, anxious moments and certainly risk meetings now taking a very different perspective and direction um, in terms of those being imagined um, only uh, six weeks or uh, a couple of months ago. So the liquidity issue, I'm just calling out this liquidity issue. I can, 30 years ago, long time ago, um, this liquidity issue has been in my mind ever, ever since. And I think that, you know, it, it will present opportunities and risks for those cl clearly, um, those with liquidity and, and uh, li liquid assets in their um, portfolios will stand to benefit from, from that. I think the difference between my early career and today, and I'll talk a bit about this maybe in question time, is just the prevalence of government at the monetary and fiscal level is just so much more active than what it was back then. And so some of that, I guess, you know, credit crunch that uh, presented opportunities um, back then um, for those with cash, you know, has been uh, somewhat dampened. Um, just a bit personal note, my, my investing, my proper investing career um, on a personal note started in a uh, property investment penthouse in Brisbane. Um, unfortunately, uh, sort of saw that go down about 40% and ran into that 21% interest rate, which I hope, hope people in the crowd um, study very carefully. And it's just such a long time ago. But um, it was the last time I ever listened to any economists. Will, with with deference to economists on on the call, um, very very um, well heeled economists that I work with uh, at State Super, ex Treasury um, economists. Well, you know, impeccable credentials. Um, took some advice from him. Took a loan out with Citibank at fifteen percent. Um, interest rates hit twenty one percent, and on their on their way down around sixteen percent. I um, you know, sought, sought his counsel and quote unquote, you'll never see interest rates this low again at 16%. So it's decided to lock in on that. And um, of course that, uh, that was a really bad, bad idea. Property continued to decline and uh, the penalty of getting out of that was um, five years of interest, I think I recall. So it was a very, very painful time. Now, fast forward to today, interest rates and liquidity are a completely different story. Every time I say they can't go lower, they do. Um, but we're getting close <clears throat> to the day when interest rates um, have, have bottomed out. Um, I think in terms of some of the um, 
we'll um, just I just want to check because I'm I'm looking at um, just uh, blank screens. Just want to check that I'm still on on air here. No, you're still on air and everything's going uh, fine. Okay, I'll just make sure I wasn't talking yeah. to myself. Um, so um, I just um, like to sort of as part of the introduction part of of my brief talk, just like to call out some numbers in terms of the returns because. Look, as, you, as most of you know, we're, we're long-term people and um, I'm not going to make a prediction around, you know, have we bottomed and, and what's it look like. I've got some positive things to say and some negative things to say. And uh, for us, it's all around the long, long term. But I do like to call out some numbers just to remind people. Look, Australia is number one over 120 years. And, and these are important numbers. They shape our thinking and our discounting of, uh, of companies and valuations. Um, generated roughly 10.5% per annum for the last 120 years. So it's a, it's a and, and Australia would be sort of a top three market in the world. Um, I think uh, the ne next one down the, the rank is the USA at around 9% per annum and inflation um, roughly three to 4%. So you can do your own maths to calculate the, the real rate of return is a nominal. So US at around 9% and then the rest of the world <clears throat> roughly seven seven percent with a bit of distribution curve around around that but clearly you know us has been certainly the biggest wealth creator over that that 120 year period in australia um due to the size but in 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 absolute terms percentage terms is actually better than than the us um the last the last uh well since we started the business back in 2001 just um after september 11 that terrible event the Australian market has delivered 7% per annum. And I think that's a quite an interesting number and that, that, that's a real anchor, anchor for me um, around, and the real return would be, you know, we'll call it that round six, five and a half, six percent real. <clears throat> um, I think that's as close as to what, you know, you know a, a good guesstimate of what future returns could look like um, for equities. The reason I like that number is that those numbers, you, you know, these, that these annualised returns suffer badly from the point to point, depending upon which you know date you use as your starting point and your ending date. The reason I like this particular number and metric, a it, it's over the period since we started the firm 19 years ago, but it's been hit by two really really significant events. One, a pandemic, you know, the current one we're we're in at the moment, and of course the global financial crisis, which is a real real nasty return, 45% down so the that's a real number um and should give people some heart that there's you know a normalization um sort of events that have been applied to that uh, 19 year period um in the in the last um sort of 10 10 to 15 years the asian markets have delivered five and a half percent since 2007 i like that number as well because you know that picks up also we that's the particular number for our Asian fund. We started just before the global financial crisis, and uh, includes the uh, the current the current downturn, or, or certainly the March numbers. So that's five and a half percent for Asia, and the equivalent numbers for the global are around seven percent for the uh, the hedged um, returns and ten percent for the unhedged returns. So as a backdrop to expectations, I think that you know that that that's a reasonable um expectation going forward and i can talk more specifically about industries and so forth maybe through q a will um, i think um just on on returns high level um and i, I want to caveat this with my a, a full and fair disclosure of my own biases um, we, we operate just long only equities no leverage no structures whatsoever um, but for the last you know five to seven years um, we're, we've been, I think public markets have generally underperformed what you'd call private markets. Um, I think that as a, you know, part of a strategic thinking about, <clears throat> you know, where to place money, um, you know, my, my observation would be, well, public markets have taken the hit, um, private markets have not. So unlisted, you know, private markets in, in property, in private equity infrastructure, um, there are a number of funds that uh, you, you know you would be extremely wary of because I would I would infer that they're in for a couple of years of pain as they recalibrate and normalise their valuations back to you know more observable 
numbers in the in the public market. The second point I'd make about public versus private is leverage, um, and I think leverage. Look, the big, the big themes of the over my career have been financialization, globalization, and credit. Um, I think I think credit um, has has got a lot to do with the superior returns in some of those private market uh, um, asset classes. And I think that, you know, some of the, uh, some of the normalization process will, will be more in favor of public markets, which generally have lower gearing than the, the private structures that you see around, around the traps. So, and if I was to use a, a listed example, I mean, the property trust sector has, has done it again. They're, they're absolutely, you know, faultless in terms of being able to mess up their balance sheets at the wrong time. They fail as a sector to understand that, you know, every 10 to 15 years you have events, whether it's pandemics or financial crises or economic crises, they fail to build balance sheets that can really handle these sort of downturns without government handouts and assistance. So I'm, um, uh, you know, been a little bit disappointed and we've been caught out ourselves in a couple of what we've called bond-like equities, which are meant to deliver during these downturns simply because of their, their structures and uh, their financial, I guess, um, structures. And I think you can put some of that down to um, incentives, you know, basically management teams or CEOs and the, uh, the man management agency class, you know, managing these structures or businesses for three to five years instead of the, you know, the 10 to 20 years that um, shareholders um, would expect. With the inference being that they've carried, you know, what, yet again, too much debt to handle these sort of downturns and then, ended up having to have um, equity issuances at, at cheap prices, which dilute all shareholders. Um, I think uh, just, just some of the, you know, some of the lessons that are observations of past years, um, and I'll just summarise these high level, we can, we can get into detail during Q&A, but look, you know, I sort of run the model, you know, the, or, or carry the mental model or three, three stages of of these downturns and of course they're always a bit different but it's just helpful to kind of think about it firstly you get the kind of liquidity rush of blood you know everyone wants to jump in at cheap prices um, you get uh, you know more pronounced this time around you know injections of liquidity both fiscal and monetary policy as I said before very very pronounced um, in, in these days around around the world um, the sec second phase is you get some sort of retraction, you know, a hangover and what are called reality sets in in terms of the real, you know, the real world. And I think there is a, I mean, it's a real kind of um, arbitrage between expectation markets, which are typically listed, you know, listed public equity markets would be kind of an expectation market in the real world where people actually have to deliver, you know, supply chains and deal with real world issues and all the Kind of public and uh, property law issues and employment law issues, which you know people are working through now, which are just horrendous if you're in real businesses. Um, so you get a bit of a, you know, a bit of a head faint, a hangover effect, um, and then you get you know the sort of the long, the elongated, and it's been a while um, since we've had this, um, you know, periods where you'd never think it's going to end, and you know, I guess that's where you get, you know, incredibly, uh, incredibly good. Good opportunities, um, and what one little indicator for us is that, you know, on, on certainly the quality companies, you know, most of the capital raisings have got away very easily, oversubscribed, and are trading at you know nice, nice premiums to issue prices, and that's been you know really, really valuable thing to participate in, which we have been, um, and you know, but a little marker that I, I love to keep in the black book is. You know, days gone by, you know, Commonwealth Bank went, you know, basically repriced down when they can't remember the exact number, you know, five dollars sixty-five, whatever the IPO price, the, the final IPO price was priced down in um, at least once before the final was was struck, and then the share price went below that. Um, you know, one of my favorites, Tab Corp, going back in the 90s, went straight through, you know, everyone you know, it's just a monopoly machine. Um, but that also went through the IPO price. Um, there's the infamous, uh, showing my age a bit here, but the, you know, the PAC or Westpac um, recapitalization, they had a big, massive, big issue and um, also went straight through the, um, 
you know, the rights, the rights issue price. And so it's just a little marker around confidence. And I love it when I see that because, you know, you really know you've cleaned out the optimists in, in the marketplace. And as long as you're not in the stock, of course, um, it's a good thing for the, um, the new buyers coming into the market. So that, that's the first, you know, sort of marker, you know, that would give some caution, I think, to, to the recovery. Um, second, the second observation I'd make in terms of our experiences, some of the, you know, some of the very best and, uh, you know, just as a, you know, just one data point, I'd really love to look at the Macquarie Bank share price due the, during the GFC. And that, 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 you know, that basically doubled, you know, got, went, went from $90 down to $14 thereabouts. Um, then went all the way back up to 30, low $30, and then, then all the way back to $20, or so a little bit under $20, um, before it really kicked in for, you know, a good, good sort of five, five to seven year of uh, magnificent out, outperformance. Um, depending upon your appetite for risk, the, the point I'm trying to make is that, and, and, and so that was, that, that, that sort of what I would call the real low risk um, time to allocate capital Macquarie was actually in that second second dip when it retraced back to the to the low twenty dollars area after after sort of getting up into the you know the low thirty dollars. Um, but the point that I want to make, I don't have the chart in front of me, but it was a couple of years after the GFC that it hit that second point. Um, same same with QBE after the September 11. It was at least nine months after the actual event. Um, and you, you, you know, you literally had, you know, sort of a year or two even, you know, to really allocate capital into, into QBE before it went on its big tear up to $30 from, from roughly five, $5. So, um, and another, another, you know, favorite of, of ours is lifestyle communities, which took, um, it had a big recapitalization, you know, many, many years after the, uh, the GFC, they sort of struggled on with a pretty, you know, pretty fully leveraged balance sheet. They were okay, but they couldn't do anything because they were kind of fully, fully capped out on their lines of credit and um, already had a very full, fully geared balance sheet. So it took a couple of years, you know, to have a sort of recapitalization event. Um, so there's lots of examples like that. Um, of course, nothing beats, you know, ducking in at the lows and kind of holding, uh, I guess, but I'm just trying to paint a backdrop. Our, perspective in terms of this recovery is that you'll get all of those things that I've just just mentioned and so um, you know whilst we've definitely been a little bit more active in the last uh, couple of months than we have been for for a number of years um, the mentality is definitely you know we're gonna we're gonna be ready for the next dip and and the dip after if, if they do come um, and if you missed out on the you know the opportunity of one of these big big recovery stories, well, don't worry about it. There's plenty coming. Um, so that's that one. Um, <clears throat> the, um, the the last uh, couple of things. Um, I just want to. I mean, I, I don't know if this is hitting your question at all, Will, but you know, a couple of big influences in my life have been books and and people. Um, you know, basically, you know, the first investment book I read was the George Soros one um, called. And I'm not a fan of George Soros, by the way, and I certainly haven't gone down that that sort of route in terms of top-down investing. But he wrote a pretty interesting book called Alchemy of Finance back in the mid-'80s. And basically, it was all about sort of uh, summarised as the, the virtuous circle. You know, your asset prices go up. You know, if your leverage equity goes up across the whole system, and so you get this virtuous circle of asset inflation, and then you get the reverse. That, that kind of summarises the uh, you reverse into a vicious cycle. That's a, an attempt to summarise the book in, in one line, um, but it had a very big impact, and you see it all the time in industries where you know success and, and fund managers for that for that matter, where you get success begets um, success um, until until you have the failure, and then you get the unwind of that. The banking industry is just just a completely um, tangible expression of that. Um, given the leverage in banks themselves and the way that the banking system works. And as I said before, one of the big um, drivers of my career, arguably um, got lucky here, has, has been the financialization of everything. I mean, you know, the, the stat that I love most is 
um, after World War II, you know, there was basically half a, half a unit of debt for every unit of GDP. Well, that's blown out to about five, it's a global stat, about five times now. And you all know about the, um, you know, the increase in the household debt in Australia to be, you know, best in class um, around the world. The, um, the whole idea of risk weighting um, of assets has really caused an explosion of um, and, and basically driven the, the um, you know, particularly the residential asset asset sector. Um, when, I when I was a banking analyst back in the early 1990s, um, you know, a dollar, <clears throat> a dollar of um, capital was behind a mortgage was rated at 100%. Well, that got down to roughly 15% for Westpac and, and CBA, um, which is a six times leverage in terms of, you know, um, the amount of assets you could hold on your balance sheet for a dollar of, of capital. Now that's that's starting to uh, reverse itself, but it's been a massive driver of the economy, the housing sector, and who knows all the second and third derivative um, industries that hang off the back of a uh, housing construction and, and home ownership in terms of retail and um, renovation markets and so on and so forth. Um, I think that, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the, um, the, the greats in terms of Warren Buffett um, and particularly Charlie Munger, um, you know, I, I actually applied for a job at Berkshire Hathaway, or wrote them a job application letter, um, didn't, didn't hear anything back from them. So I rang them in 1993, I think it was, um, I rang Charlie Munger's office in Los Angeles and to my surprise, his um, secretary agreed to a meeting with uh, Charlie Munger at the Californian Club in, in LA and um, they turned me down for the job, but I uh, got the meeting anyway, so that was good. Um, but the one thing that Charlie Munger said to me is just, just absolutely sticks out in my mind. And it was this, that uh, he said, Peter, you and I are in completely different businesses, which was a bit of a surprise to me because I was thinking that um, you know, we were in the same, same uh, same job of investment, investing. And, and effectively what he was saying was that I'm, I was in an open-ended industry. So, you know, in terms of Cooper Investors, for example, and fund managers generally, you know, have open-ended funds. Um, and certainly ones that uh, these days, many of them have traded LICs and so forth, but they're subjected to, I guess, market forces and, and public market commentary. Whereas the Berkshire Hathaway model whilst it's a listed company, it's a closed end private company and the allocation of capital can be much longer term and, um, you know, basically they, you know, did and do what they, they want to. And uh, anyone who follows the, uh, the commentary coming out of uh, Munger and, and Buffett would kind of realise and admire, I guess, their commitment to their beliefs and shaping their investment styles and philosophies um, around their core beliefs to no one else's. Um, so I think that, um, you know, and uh, sorry, I just want to call out Roy Newberger um, from Newberg and Burnham. I've worked at Bank National Dupree for uh, a short, short while and they own 30% of that, that company back in um, 1994 when I worked there. Um, and uh, Roy Newberger was a pretty inspirational fellow. He uh, died at 107 year, years of age. And uh, whilst I visited that organisation, he, he, he was 87 coming coming into the office. And so I'm just a great believer, um, self-promoter here, um, that uh, you know age can be really, really helpful in terms of recognising some of these these patterns, um, you know, and uh, kind of I guess distilling you know risk and return concepts and building building out uh, latency in decision making um, and not not putting. I think. What I'm trying to say is that, you know, age gives you a, a perspective that it's not black and white. It's not all, di and this is what I'm saying about the current um, corona um, pandemic. Um, I can't, can't really say any more than you guys are reading in the, in the press, but it's not black and white. There's going to be opportunities. There will be recovery. Um, and there'll be some nasty reveals, I suspect, in terms of this second derivative. And that's the consistent message that uh, some of those um, greats and mentors that, that I've followed over the years, and that's certainly been uh, validated by, by my own experiences. Um, 
So, Will, I think um, I might um, pause there and given that we're at the 30 minute mark and uh, we can um, go to q and A. I can pivot to areas of interest. Great. Thank you, Peter. Look, uh, we've already got some questions, so I'm going to go straight over to those. Um, the first one's from Miraj, um, and he said, can Australia do without China? Um, well, I don't think so, not, not in the short term. 30% um, of our exports and, uh, you know, the, the, the student numbers, um, you know, basically underwrite uh, Australian tertiary education. So it, it's a, you know, it's a dependency. Um, I, I uh, you know, I, I'd expand that question to, well, you know, can ASEAN um, and America um, survive without without China. So I think China has become a very significant um, part of the global economy. One of the, so, um, you know, the likely, the likely outcome, and I think this is a global um, response to globalization in a way. I mean, you know, America closed down there. You know, we don't really have manufacturing anymore in this country. And I would have said, I'm not promoting either or, but this has, you know, got a great deal of tension around, you know, the free, the free trade, um, philosophy that sat behind globalization. You know, I think you're already seeing a wind back of that um, on the arguments of sort of uh, domestic interests um, on the basis of national sovereignty, um, on the basis of national security. The US closed their last penicillin plant, I believe, in 1994. Um, um, I was just talking to one of our, my colleagues today about, you know, masks and gowns and a lot of the a lot of the consumables going into the US medical system, you're getting, you know, very, very high inflation in that area because of the demand, but it's all coming from, you know, Asia and particularly China. And so I think in terms of kind of national risk management, you know, just follow the, follow the, um, um, you know, commentaries from an Andrew Hasty is influential inside the Liberal Party and you'll, you'll see where, you know, the pendulum, I think probably went maybe too far, but, you know, I think there'll be a kind of a middle middle road where Australia just really balance it up. Just on that point, by the way, I think it's a kind of a and, and as you know, well, we've got an Asian fund, so we're we're invested across you know all of Asia. Um, but it's kind of a it's a bit of a ballpoint on India as a as a global diversification point. And one of the things that we've heard um, and from tracking, you know, there's lots of interest in terms of uh, manufacturing and you know, relocation just from a diversity perspective. Um, even in terms of the Chinese companies, you know, they're they're actually relocating a lot of their factories into these other other countries um, on the basis that they're either cheaper or you know to sort of get around some of these um, overweight positions that China have in in the supply chain. Um, but Australia, um, you know, it's uh, we, you know I consider that we're Consider that we're lucky in, in you know, with, with the caveat of this, you know, the agenda behind this question, which is a good one. Um, we're lucky in terms of our, I guess, uh, location um, because, you know, I think the, um, you know, the latency that still exists in China and, and these emerging markets and Asia is, you know, frankly, Asia is, is the emerging markets of the, of the world. Um, you know, we're, we're really close. We've got lots of networks and so I'm, um, you know, quietly thankful that we are in, in this neck of the woods. Thank you. Look, uh, David uh, is asking, with an eye on, the hedged, on your hedged global equities fund, can you share your perspective on key currencies, including the US dollar, in the medium term, say three to five years? Um, yeah, the, re the reason we started a hedged hedged product is because, um, you know, we don't really take active hedge, you know, we have an unhedged and a, and a fully hedged effectively. But what I, what I would say is that, you know, down at, down at 55 cents, we had a lot of conversation in a couple of the other, other funds that were, were uh, unhedged, Brunswick Fund in particular. And it's not surprise. It, it was too cheap there, I think, you know, the old sort of, Back of the cab, coffee, coffee, uh, McDonald's, McDonald's burger test, um, compared to you know European and North America, and particularly in the cities, 
you know, the big, the big um, urban cities around the world, including Asia. I mean, Australia started to feel pretty reasonable um, at, at below 60 cents. So in our, um, in our assumptions, you know, long-term assumptions, we're, we're around 70 cents on, on it, sorry, in, on our assumptions in terms of the models that we, we build on some of the uh, exporters and um, import sensitive companies that we invest in, in in Australia. And so, you know, we would think around 70 cents um, is a reasonable guesstimate, but down at 60, you know, uh, under 65, it feels, feels like it's in the cheap zone. Yep. Uh, Michael's asking Biden versus Trump. What difference the world economy will the outcome deliver? There's a big macro question. Um, oh, Biden's a blue clot, you know, he's going to win on these blue collar votes. Uh, so he, he's, he, you know, like, well, let's, let's throw off the philosophy observation, not prediction. Let me throw a few predictions. Biden will win. Um, and he'll win for these reasons. One, three million old Americans have died since the last election, and three million millennials or uh, under under voting ages have come in into the um, electorate. Um, so that's six million, um, and there, I mean, there, my guess would be kind of seven. That that statistic would be seventy percent in favour of the Democrats. So they'll get their they'll get their numbers simply because of, of that. Um, little straw poll of uh, a couple of people I know and my, my partner's American and her parents live in Florida, which is a bit of a Republican, but voted Republican last time. Um, in their, and they're in kind of a, you know, upper, upper middle class type um, uh, resort style living in, in Florida. And, you know, the conversation, they're Democrats, um, but they're, they're, um, they live in, you know, sort of 50-50 Republican Democrats and just more conversation about kind of Trump losing the respect, if you like, of, of some of those those uh, centre centre right type Republicans. So I, that, that's my you know guess. Um, um, I, I reckon um, Biden is the middle you know the middle way sort of guy. He's you know he's a sort of a middle way, sensible, almost. Clinton, Clinton-esque, I think. Um, you know, any of the other candidates would have been, um, I think, pretty bad for business. So, um, you know, I think that. Um, I mean, he. I mean, under either, and, and this is the problem. And I guess just from personal I mean, we're talking about big spenders. Trump's a big spender now. You know, he's a super big spender. You know, the seven trillion dollar man. Um, so, um, you know, I, I'm not sure it, it, it's going to be much different, actually, because they're just both going to be trying to address, you know, this, the, the backdrop of the pandemic. Sorry, that's a bit of a cop out, but that's where I'm at. No, no, that's fine. Look, apart from the speed of um, what we saw in this downturn and also the recovery, is, is there any things that have, uh, you know, resulted from this that have surprised you? And therefore, you know, that you have responded to as a result in your portfolios? Um, I think, uh, I think the, to me, this pen, so, so the um, surprises, I mean, you know, like st st stocks has been a few gone a bit lower than what we wanted. Um, you know, because we'd thought about them as being resilient and stalwart, you know, super stalwarts type of thing. So there's a number of stocks like that that um, kind of didn't, didn't behave. Because what we do, Will, is go through, there's this thing called good, bad performance and bad, bad performance. So the bad is the one that sort of, you know, pandemic stock prices go down. That's not a surprise, but some of them perform very badly. And... Um, that was a bit bit of a surprise, I guess. So, you know, so, uh, I'll give you some examples. Um, you know, in, in the, <clears throat> I mean, in the superannuation area, you know, you would have thought these big, you know, some of the some of the um, funds have had, you know, very very large contributors with small balances across, you know, cafes, hospitality, the arts. Um, well, what what you know, obviously with cafes, retail. 
you know, people people working in that sort of in, in the arts, for example, work work in you know work at night in the theatres and then work by day in the cafes. Well, they've got you know double double whammy. So I think it's it's a, just a classic where you get you know conflation of different risks all coming together um, as, as one. So that's happened in in my area. Then then there's the kind of the um, I guess the airport you know the airport asset class would be another one. You know, it's just been, um, and I, I guess not a surprise. I mean, pandemics, um, you know, have been modelled and thought about, but we're just not conscious. You know, we have, we, we weren't kind of, I guess, um, you, you know, you mark it off as a risk, you know, 10 years ago, and then you forget about it. And, and then, you know, SARS, yeah, it was a risk, got over that, move on, think about another risk, but you just kind of miss it. So there's a whole bunch of assets that have, you know, really, really challenged airports, um, you know, just to call out. At one, who who would have thought, sort of thing. Um, I think um, you know the child, the child care. So so we the era I'm alluding to some of the social infrastructure. So we, you know, really I think did a pretty good job thinking through some of these REITs and some of these um, you know property trusts and uh, you know utility styled um, securities that pretend to be you know low risk spinster and widow type stocks and decided not to buy them for you know management and balance sheet structures so we thought we did a pretty good job but then we we, we picked out a couple in what i call more like social infrastructure um and and some of the child minding area arena probably trust would be an example you know really got hammered um and i guess that you know sort of single they, they've come back pretty well but you know, I must say, the uh, just shake, shakes you up a bit because, you know, that, in that example, you know, 15-year leases, triple net leases, you know, beautiful balance sheet, real high-quality operators in, in, in the main in their, in their suite of properties. So really thought through the quality attributes that go into property ownership, only to find, well, you know, pandemic kids don't go to kindergartens. So anyway, th there was a couple of those. Um, um, I think, I think, uh, you know, your, your major sectors, um, have performed broadly as, as you would expect, you know, the retail, you know, in line with a kind of pandemic. Oh, sorry, the, the just the thing that really stood out. So we, before the, before the pandemic, right, we'd been going on, there's sort of three really big meta kind of clusters that, we're kind of thinking about one, one before the pandemic, the increasing intervention of governments into industry. Okay, so post pandemic, that's that's on that statement's on steroids. So there's two sorts of companies those that'll be stifled by government and those that'll benefit by government. And just to lean back in the GFC, using Macquarie Bank as an example, they took three billion dollars, basically underwritten by the Reserve Bank. You know, guarantee that came in during the GFC, um, took the, took the deposits, went went off to you know went off to the races, bought asset management businesses at the bottom of the cycle, re participated in recapitalising Rio Tinto. They did a magnificent job, care of taxpayers of Australia. So that's a benefit. You know that that they were smart enough and good enough, and um, um, you know so we're we're looking for companies that benefit from from government. Um, I guess interventions, guarantees, and, and so on and so forth, and and try to avoid the ones that are going to get caught up in regulation um, and 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 government interference. The second one is what are called the new economy. Um, you know, think of internet, cloud as as an example. Um, once again, post post um, pandemic, you know, we've basically bought the the trend that everyone was seeing. I guess. Um, that trend has been rebased upwards without without question. You know, at least two to five years of brought forward. Um, um, there's that famous quote, can't remember who said it, but you know, software is eating eating the world. Um, well, that you know that you know, the Zoom economy um, is very exciting. And I, I, at a personal level, what it's done. Yes, yes, I was a Skype user before before this, um, but we're running a 48 person company on Zoom and I can give you lots of examples where communication and connection have gone up. It's been better in terms of getting team dynamics working. Um, I, 
I, the, the offsetting point is I'm getting a little bit of cabin fever and it's a little bit exhausting doing, you know, 3D meetings um, back, back to back all day. But uh, we'll bring a bit of balance to that, that later on. So, so the, the pandemic has brought that forward. Um, and the third one um, that we talked about is this idea of the, uh, you know, connection and community and alignment with stakeholders, you know, from company products to, to customers. Um, boy, oh boy, you, you've just, you guys, everyone would have been exposed, you know, people just, just wanting to belong, whether it's, you know, local, local communities or coalescing in online communities, um, you know, uh, responsible investing, ESGs just on steroids, you know, um, we, we really love the topic because in a way we're proud to be espousing, espousing that. I uh, read a quote, we had a presentation on Len Lease today. Um, I think it's in the, in the Len Lease annual report. Dick Dusseldorf back in 1974, Len Lease annual report was talking about, you know, how you've got to do more for, you know, social collateral um, and, uh, and community, not, not just sort of, you know, mil milking, milking the cow sort of thing. So, you know, this idea of um, having connection between customer and product and companies is one that we're really comfortable with and you can see it playing out in terms of the winners winners and the losers so I think the big thing for us around the pandemic is actually just just lit a little fire under those three things that we we've kind of already been trying to grapple with um, actually we've got the questions have built quite quite a number of them now so we'll, we'll try and get through them. Um, Yes and no. Yep. <laughs> what are some of the key Australian economic data points you are now particularly focused on in terms of where to from here for the economy? Employment. 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 Number one. Yeah. I mean, it underwrites. It underwrites. The, the banks have told us for years, don't worry about house prices. It's just all about employment. So getting getting people back back to work is uno numero. I think re, and and reform. Um, you've, you've seen a few hints coming out of the Liberals. The unions are onto it and responding loud and clear, um, as are the left side of politics about about that. So that that arm wrestle around reform, it's a you know that old saying: never waste a uh, a recession or a downturn or a crisis is a real one. And Australia should just bite the bullet and get on with the reforms that we need to do. So that's, that's my two dots there. Okay. Uh, Damon's asking: How worried? should we be about our six findings about the flood of retail investors into the market over the past four months, trying to time the upswing? Are they determined to catch falling knives as I think it was Tony Boyd put it in Chanticleer today? Well, it's interesting. I think I read something um, yesterday that the ASIC have done a statistical analysis on what happens to the shares on the day that retail buy and uh, the, the track record wasn't, wasn't good. Oh, look, that they, they should just get out of the road. Uh, I, I mean, seriously, um, you know, there's advisors, there's, there's called, you know, responsibility. Um, you know, if people want to invest, let them invest. It's, you know, we're not a, we're not a nanny state. So. Yeah. Uh, Stuart's asking governments, federal and state, will have to consider various measures to repair their balance sheets at some stage. How can this be managed without negatively impacting both the economy and financial markets? Um, well, it's a delicate, delicate question. I don't, I don't really know, but I, I, I think, you know, you'll see, <clears throat> I mean, you'd be thinking about GST, you'd be thinking about big profit pools. Um, one of the things with the banking sector, it's a big, big profit pool. Um, so, um, you know, uh, I think spreading, you know, kind of spreading spreading the the tax burden you know, there's lot, lot, lots of talk about inequality and, and so on and so forth but getting i mean we've had so many inquiries into tax efficiency there's um you know australia is already a heavily taxed country um which is not doesn't seem to be well appreciated because when you throw in um superannuation which is a, actually a tax um you know i think i think there's um you know there's efficiency problems um, you know, in the system that, that surely can get the brains trust together to make it, uh, you know, easier. I think, um, you know, uh, you know, taxes on, on employment, you know, could be better deployed elsewhere. 
um, employment flexibility or inhibitions to fl employment flexibility. It's become, you know, pretty, I can give you some personal anecdotes later on, but it's pretty, it's pretty tough. You know, the, the, um, the uh, barriers to employing people. So, you know, you loosen that up, you, you try and spread, spread the pain um, um, of taxation and you clean up the public service. I mean, there's a, you know, the productivity, you know, let me rattle them off, submarine contract, NBN, um, you know, children's hospitals around, around you know, we're, we're talking hundreds of billions of dollars, I mean, goodness. So, you know, there's a few pennies you could pinch from them. Uh, look, this is a really good question um, from Anita. In your observation, with the benefit of your years of experience, what qualities will you be looking for in business leaders fit for purpose to work through and succeed on the other side? Um, oh, and you're already seeing it, you know, in the, in, in the good companies. You want what we call focus, focus managers, you know, people with experience, um, people with skin in, and, and what we get, not only skin in the game, but soul in the game. You know, people who have done their time in industry that know where the, the skeletons are, can make quick decisions efficiently. Um, yeah, like just, just people with long, you know, long term alignment to, to shareholders. I just think that, um, you know, the long term bit is important because it, it'll make you. Um, take take the pain now, because you you know if you're around for the long term, if you've got a twenty year view um, and perspective, you'll you'll take those you know hard decisions. A in terms of cutting costs, maybe, um, or investing in in new things um, to regenerate the business. You won't let go of valuable you know um, stakeholders, whether they be employees or customers. You'll really understand understand that. Um, we we look for you know sort of summarised as you know competency and energy. So uh, you know high high energy managers who want to get down and dirty and not not put in layers of oxygen bandits in the into these you know structures. So I think there's a lot of a lot of um, cost out in industry um, that will that will happen now. Now that's going to be painful um, because at at the aggregate level that's going to hit you know hit various sectors and employment and so forth. But in the medium, the long term, it's a, you know, it'll be a good thing. Um, Steve is asking, can you share your view on the medium term outlook for Europe? Um, <clears throat> it's a big, look, it's, it's, a, it's a very broad question, but in, in general, I would say, um, you know, what, what you've seen, out of Europe is what you're going to get. Um, it's a low growth pop population, you know, is, is sluggish to declining. Um, you know, you've got the beer states and the, the beer drinkers and the wine drinkers. Um, I think, um, you know, the Scandinavians, you know, have been, have been uh, pretty, pretty interesting and good and sort of managed um, through high, you know, what I've called high cost, high value, but they've, they've got, a, you know, they've got business models that have, kind of accommodated that through outsourcing and, you know, flexibility down the corporate and even tax, you know, they're high tax at personal level, but they've worked out the corporate, you know, it's very lowly taxed. And so they've, you know, very favorably supporting the business sector. Um, you know, I, I, I think, I think they've got problems in terms of, you know, the EU and, you know, the disunity across, you know, across the, the various economies and the dislocations between, um, you know, mem member states. So, um, you know, and reform is just so, it seems to be so difficult. Um, we we had, the, had the big crisis, but it hasn't, hasn't really kind of turned into a dynamic state. So I think, I think what we've seen is what we're going to get. It's low, low growth. Yeah. Uh, look, in the interest of time, this will be the last question. So Raj started with the first question and he's um, finishing with the last question. So uh, he's asking what your view is on the metals. Now, when Raj asked that, I think he's asking precious metals because I know what his interest is. Uh, got gold and silver. Yeah. Um, look, it's a macro question. I'll give you a personal personal opinion. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer in, in uh, precious metals as a insurance policy 
um, well, it's got two things. It's got insurance premium built into it and a big, big one. I mean, we're into uncharted waters now in terms of uh, on a global basis and the scale, you know, when do, when do governments run out of money? Well, you know, I guess some would say, well, Japan's a good market. We can keep on going, but yeah, I, I think that insurance premiums here, here to stay um, until, until we get real, real rectification of that question of debt. Um, and then the inflation question, which, um, you know, has been around forever and just hasn't, hasn't really come through. Um, but, you know, there is, there is inflation in the system and there's um, this, this pandemic is obviously going to, you know, create a whole heap of over, oversupply and that probably gets kicked down the road. But, um, you know, continuation of, of money creation like we've seen is uh, bound to show up in in uh, broader broader inflation going forward. So I'm a, I'm a believer as an insurance um, side of things. And then there's the, you know, the, the actual stock stock is a different, different kettle of fish. And uh, so, but yeah, we, we like, you know, got a few, few gold stocks in the portfolio. So um, uh, I noticed the gold silver spread has um, blown out to record record levels as well. Um, I don't I don't have a particular view on that, other than it seems to be a mean reverting sort of relationship. Um, so um, yeah, and then you know then then the other the other uh, more industrial metals are really subject to you know sort of the uh, G GDP. Um, Supply demand, so you know things like copper and so forth are you know trading trading below their kind of normalised levels until we get economies back up and running, which will be a while, you know, a year away. That's uh, going to be a bit subdued. All right. Well, look, thank you, um, Peter. Look, and very much for your insights, your time. These things I know they take time to prepare for as well. So thank you for that and. Also, um, you know, I think the, the number of questions that you've received is sort of a testament to the, the participants and how they found that as well. So look, we, we very much appreciate um, everything you've done so, and, and attending, so thank you very much. For the participants, uh, we'll be having another invite going out in about a week's time. But uh, thank you, everybody. Um, have a great evening and uh, look forward to catching up hopefully in person soon. Thanks, Will. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye now.